Uh, I'm going to rift off of what you raised, Marianne, about competencies. Um, I think that that is, you know, something to think about, too. Um, Marianne just she asked a clarifying question about what are competencies and and how do should we understand what they are uh, in our organizations and in our businesses and, and in your careers <clears throat> and competencies as as she articulated it it comes down to skills what do you do well what do you offer what do you present to the marketplace that is consistent um and when when developing your competencies it can be very challenging for an organization it can be challenging for leaders to identify what they do well. I had this conversation last week with some friends. I have this conversation, quite frankly, all the time with friends um, because it's a topic of pain for a lot of people to really do some sort of deep reflection about what they do well and to acknowledge it and to admit it and to accept it. Uh, it is difficult in, in human nature to to declare audibly, literally, boastfully, confidently that I am here in the marketplace to do X. And the restraint, the discipline it takes to not say anything else is hard because we don't want to not be acknowledged for everything else we're capable of doing, right? We typically show up and say, I can do X, Y, and Z as well as A, B, and C. And when that happens, it really is a ball of confusion when you're trying to communicate and articulate your core competency and a consistent, clear message to people you're trying to talk to, communicate with, or sell products to. This is true for nonprofits. And I'm going to go around the bend for a moment around nonprofits and individuals. This is really a huge pain point. Um, I remember – one of the one of several agonizing thoughts in my professional career that I had to go through or questions I had to answer was, you know, which doctoral degree to choose. Now, I already got admitted to the doctoral program um, I pursued at the time, but there were still there was still a choice to be made. There were several choices to be made. The first choice was, do you want to pursue an applied degree or a PhD? Can I tell you that me and my uh, cohort members agonized. We had a one week res residency. We agonized for days uh, in Virginia trying to figure out what to select, what to do. And I remember <clears throat> I got there on a Sunday, made my decision on a Wednesday, scared that I'm going to select the wrong degree pathway and be left out of something. Right. Second choice we had to make, <clears throat> which was several years off, but it was best that you you know, started thinking about it earlier was, OK, you selected this particular pathway, which major within that pathway are you going to focus on? And that became difficult over the years. <clears throat> but I remember Dr. Winston made a comment during his uh, lecture that never left me, never, never left me. And I'm going to share this comment with you as individuals. I'm going to share this with you as leaders of organizations uh, leaders of people, leaders of processes and systems and culture and uh, marketplace progress. This is These are the words of Dr. Winston. Um, well, this first part is kind of hilarious because it applies to you all. He said that uh, master degree students, the graduates, believe that they are God's gift to everybody because they know everything and they've mastered everything. That's supposed to be a joke. You're supposed to laugh because you guys are master level students. <laughs> but it was true because we're we're like in our first week of residency and we are size each other up. We all got master's degrees and, and we're trying to see who's better. And we already think we're awesome sauce. And he says, it is so not true. You've mastered nothing. And then he says this faithful statement that um, sticks with me to this day, but applies to us in business and leadership. He said this. That when you graduate with your doctorate degree, you're going to graduate stupid. You're going to be dumb. You're going to graduate dumb. Then he continues and says, when you graduate, you're going to know a whole lot about the period at the end of the sixth sentence of the twelfth chapter of the sixth anthology of the topic that you decided to study. In essence, he said that you're going to know a lot about one grain of sand. And know nothing about everything else. And this is life. Powerful statement. 
because you assume that you're going into this degree program, this learning program to get this expansive knowledge. And the assumption is this expansive knowledge is about a lot of stuff. The truth is it is not. It is a lot of knowledge about one little thing. And the fear most of us had, the fear most people had, the fear most nonprofit leaders have is if I niche down, I'm leaving opportunity on the table. That is one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves and we believe it is absolutely not true. In fact, the term goes that the riches are in the niches because the more you know about a thing, one thing, the more you're able to systematize it, the more you're able to uh, product, uh, monetize it, the more you're able to improve the delivery of that thing and apply it to a variety of potential customers that you're going to come in contact with. So translation to the nonprofit world, the more you focus in on your category of service to youth, veterans, women, domestic violence survivors, housing, uh, low income families, folks who are addicted, folks who have mental illness challenges, etc. whatever your, your topic is, the more you focus, the more you're going to find opportunity and the focus doesn't stop there. You can't just focus on a single population only. You got to specialize even within that population who you uh, service. So in some of your other coursework, you're going to hear me talk about this. We talk about youth development, and I talk about youth development through the lens of workforce development or vice versa. We talk about workforce development through the lens of youth, 1824. You can focus on multiple categories of youth. I remember um, in some of my previous work, um, and some of the advice when I gave to some clients, when they would say, I want to work with youth, I said, that's a way too broad statement to make. Well, I'm going to work with youth from kindergarten to the 24. That's a huge problem because the mindset of 18 and 24 year olds is totally different from 14 and 18 year olds, which is high school, totally different from uh, uh, 13, uh, let's say from nine to 13 and then from, you know, K to four, K to five, the mindsets are just dramatically different. And for those of you that have children in multiple age categories, you know, that's the case. So how can you say as a provider that we're here to serve K to 24 from six years old to 24 years? old? That implies that you have the resources to have specialists and teams of specialists for each age category as young people grow and mature through their process of thinking. Otherwise, if you do not have that, if you're a new organization, small organization, a medium organization, that's small and medium at the same time, um, you don't have the resources to kind of spread thin. It's impossible. So now you're going to have to be much more intentional about your niching down. If you're going to do, just for the sake of the uh, the example I give in BNP 615, if you're going to do, I think let's lead with um, uh, workforce development, specifically with youth, that term youth is broad. So we're going to have to be intentional to say 18 to 24-year-olds because this is kind of the college certificate earning age of these are folks who now have earning potential to take care of themselves. They become legal in our country. They, they can tap into resources and information and benefits of being a full alleged uh, citizen in our country. So that is kind of that early stage professional. That is a different body of work than working with a bunch of high school kids who are still trying to figure out life. That is also different from dealing with 25 to 35 year olds who are likely into their second or third job or career. Right. It's also different when you're dealing with 35 to 45 year olds who may be in the midlife area, making complete transitions in their career, have kids and families to deal with, still loan debt, et cetera. And it's totally different from the senior population who's coming to the end of their arc of working. But working just to make some ends meet, not to survive uh, and build a career. It's a totally different mindset. To be even more specific, are you going to do workforce development for youth 18, 24-year-olds, and what type of uh, a background will these young people have? Are you going to be dealing with low-income individuals, individuals of color, individuals of, of affluence, individuals who come from well-performing high schools, individuals who come in from tough inner-city backgrounds? Are you going to deal with individuals who are returning citizens, individuals who have a very low reading uh, a reading uh, level, individuals who have some experience in work or no experience in work? We went through multiple categories here with young people. Where are you niching down to?
I'm going to serve the entire country. Yeah, no. <laughs> you all are based somewhere in Macon, Georgia. I'm up here in Connecticut. Uh, whoever is going to watch this video later is somewhere else in the country. It is such a different demographic and culture depending on where we live. So you got to niche down. Why am I hitting on this? This goes back to Marianne's question about competencies. What are your skills? Your skills are cultivated by the decisions you make to niche down and to be even more specific. And you will be surprised if you are scared to make that decision. You'll be surprised at the opportunities that will be afforded to you because of your unique knowledge and abilities. Before I go into <clears throat> my reference point here, uh, this does not mean you do not have or you do not cultivate other skills. You do. You absolutely do. You have other skills because of how you've been classically trained academically, your other life experiences, your your career brings new experiences and and, and, and uh, opportunities for you to uh, kind of explore what you do well. But you've got to be clear about the thing that you're putting forward that you're selling to the marketplace. I remember several years back. My consultant company, Eli Patrick and Co. Uh, I decided as I was going through kind of a, a, a focus of what we're going to do, I decided based upon some, I thought some some really clear analysis, the best thing for us to sell and to lead with is we help nonprofits raise money. Now I, I'm competent in other areas. I'm really good in other things that I, I could do a bunch of stuff. I can sell a bunch of stuff, but I determined that there were some things working against me, age, background, experiences, relationships. I was lacking in those areas and it didn't give me a fair shot as I thought to compete with others who've been in the business, who've been in the industry for a very long time. But the area where I thought I could compete that didn't, that wasn't against me was in the area of fundraising. I was getting good at it. Uh, I was really developing the skills and raising millions of dollars, and I developed my own philosophy of how to do that, and it was consistent, and I was teaching my staff to do it. I figured, okay, well, I can teach this, and I can help people raise money, and this is agnostic to some of the other things that are against me. I struggled, though. I struggled to not mention, oh, yeah, I'm really good at A, B, and C, and D as well. But I also noticed that as I niched down and as I begin to talk about what I do, and it was a very clear statement, help nonprofits raise money, the reactions were tremendous in terms of that's clear. We need help. Can you help us? And then this is the crazy thing that happens when you niche down. People discover that you have other skills, other abilities, and they ask, hey, can you help with strategic planning? Sure can. Can you help with leadership development? Absolutely can. Can you help facilitate our meeting? Sure thing. These are things I'm really, really good at. Strategy development, really, really good at. Leadership development, really, really good at. Program design, really, really good at it. But I don't sell it. I don't promote it. It's not the thing I lead with, but my customers find out about it, and it ends up becoming an opportunity uh, to provide other services to our customers. The reason I brought this up, the reason why I had this little talk here is because if you look at the slide 11 in your presentation – around uh, uh, coming up with the one idea, coming up with the idea for your nonprofit, uh, your nonprofit uh, social venture, coming up with the idea for the launch of your new nonprofit, coming up with the idea of how you're going to serve nonprofits. Notice there are three circles here that they highlight. Number one, it highlights you got to understand patterns uh, in the business, in the marketplace. What are the patterns in your niche? If you're not niched down enough, you will be wildly ignorant of these patterns. You have probably heard me say this uh, before, but I'm going to say this again. Your funders are so smart. Your funders, the people who are paying the bills, who are writing the checks, who are giving the grants, they are super, super smart. The reason why they're smart, they study patterns within multiple niches, and they can tell by the quality or lack thereof of your grant application that you don't understand the patterns of the segment, the marketplace, or the niche. And for some of you, as you're listening to this, uh, whether it's live or in the rebroadcast, you're wondering, why am I not getting the funds uh, that we are targeting? <clears throat> why are we not performing well on our grants? It, it, it could be because uh, you're not able to communicate a clear thought and understanding of the patterns 
of the marketplace. So for our example with youth and workforce development, you're not understanding the patterns of workforce development, how it works in your industry, it works rather in your region. Uh, youth uh, employment, how that works. Youth education, how that works. Uh, youth uh, engagement in certain communities, how that works, how all this plays out. You got to understand the patterns. So when you start to build a social venture to support the work of your nonprofit, it has to be tied to, in my view, uh, to the patterns you recognize uh, in the marketplace. Number two, you got to have social assets. These are assets that says that we uh, have ties into the community. We have programs in, into the community. We have significant relationships in the community. And that means that we have some sort of foundation to launch this thing and to be successful. So if you're going to launch a, uh, a business that's designed to employ young people, regardless of what it is, Right. The social asset is you understand youth behavior, youth workforce, youth engagement, et cetera. And you understand what it takes to bring them to a place where they are ready to be employed and they can show up to work every day consistently until they get on their own two feet and graduate from your business to another person's business. Right. That's a huge social asset. The case management support that you provide to these young people to ensure that they have the support they need to be the best professional that they can be in this season of their life. A huge social asset. Right. The respect of the community that people know that they can refer young people to your program. Major social asset. So now we have a pattern that we understand or multiple patterns that we understand. We have social assets. And then last piece, when you're looking for this idea uh, to launch for your social venture, what is the social need? So the social need in our example is more young people need jobs. It will have an impact, significant impact on reducing violence, poverty, uh, et cetera, in our community, right? The, so the social needs are great in our community, but what we're doing to build this social venture will start to put a dent in those needs. Whatever the focus is, if your focus is less young people involved in the justice system, then you're going to track that social need by way of this social venture. If you're looking to reduce teen pregnancy rates, you're going to do so through this employment project. You're going to track that social need being addressed. You want to see more young people enrolled in certificate programs, two-year programs, four-year programs, et cetera, while working. You're going to track that social need being impacted because of the employment. You want to see more young people developing the capacity, the skills to be self-sufficient economically. You're going to track that uh, through the work you're doing with your social venture. So you're identifying a social need, and this social need should be consistent with what your nonprofit already cares about. It should be consistent with the mission and the vision of your organization. It shouldn't be this wild theory that's divergent from your day-to-day -day work. If you're a youth serving organization or a workforce organization that's serving youth and young adults, the social venture should have some sort of relevance to this. This goes back to last week's talk about, you know, how do you monetize your skills, your competencies, your abilities? These competencies and, and skills and abilities are cultivated by just doing the thing you do every day, but you're adding on to it a monetized element to this. All right. So for those of you that are thinking about social ventures, how to sustain your organization by adding or creating a, a social venture, or perhaps you want to just start a social venture that has a very deep connection to a community need and a nonprofit. These are things to consider.